Good morning. It's a, a, a big honor to be here. Actually, the fellow behind me reminded me of that a few minutes ago. He said, you know, you've got big shoes to fill. Um, and so uh, when Mark asked me to talk about backwards, I realized that actually that is the only way to come up with a creative solution. And it's the only way that I've been successful. I just hadn't thought of it that way before. Um, my good friend Stephanie Kiernan's in the front row. She was my executive assistant for three years, and I think it's extraordinary that we become such close friends, and we worked on this together, and no one's paying us to do it. We're not trying to get votes to do it. It's who we became, and it's who we intend to be for the rest of our lives, and I appreciate that. So Stephanie said, I said, well, I don't really get this quote. What do you mean fear of the unknown? It should say fear of the known is what... We should, not, we should get going on and not be afraid of. So she knows how to make a red stripe over the un in the computer. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so um, I thought, okay, you know what? What do we know? We know that childhood obesity is growing. We know that 39% of Indian reserves have water systems that are at high risk. We know that the planet is warming and that the polar ice cap is melting. Uh, we know that Canada is 54th in terms of um, uh, equality for women holding elected office. We know a lot of things that we should be really curious about and that we should not be afraid of whatsoever. Um, the Athenians use the term idiot to describe people who are oblivious to public affairs. And I think that's actually really important because people, it's almost stylish to not care. And, uh, and so, I think we should, this talk is gonna be a, about replacing the fear of what we know with our curiosity. From the audience, what do you see in this picture? Water. What's Van Water? Lights, clouds. The clouds are kinda like, you know, yikes. Um, it's a tremendous responsibility to be elected mayor. When I, every time I go over the Lionsgate Bridge, I try not to have a heart attack about <laughs> what I was responsible for. Because what I see is the entrance to the Port of Vancouver, tremendous responsibility to our local economy and, and national economy. I see the ocean, which is two thirds of the planet. The planet should really be called ocean, not earth. But we didn't know that at the time because we thought it was flat and went, um, the, the, the mountains behind are not only the visual you know, setting for our amazing city, but it's an entire ecosystem that has blue and red listed species that protects the drinking water, the watershed, and the Capilano watershed for um, a lot of the community. There's, there's um, a high density along the waterfront. West Vancouver has actually had high density since the 60s. People forget that. I like to say to Daryl Masato, the mayor of the city of North Van, it's nice that you're catching up because we've always had a sustainable community. And there's a lot of single-family homes marching across the mountainside that we needed to change um, the pattern of development. Moving closer to home, this is the first West Coast modern house designed in Canada in 1948. It's the BC Binning House. And I love this picture because it's not a picture of the house. It's a picture of what home should be on the West Coast, or could be, because it means it takes, we take our inspiration from nature and from a, a, a transparency and from fluidity between the indoors and the outdoors. And also, it reminds us a little bit that this was a colonized place. There's still the kind of traditional manicured garden. But we're moving towards this. This is old growth forest in West Vancouver. And this is, I think, really what it means to be a Vancouverite. It's a public trust. And I was really um, made aware of that when the World Urban Forum came in 2006. The response that people gave at the time, I was the mayor of West Van, Sam Sullivan was the mayor of Vancouver, and Ken Melamed, Green Whistler mayor, 
So the three of us are standing there, like not looking like we match at all. And other, other people from, particularly California, the designers from California that we were hanging around with said, you know, where, do, where does Vancouver get people like you to do this? Um, sometimes we have to be way outside of our context to recognize who we are and, um, and what we're capable of. And so this kind of leads into uh, why, I, why I ran for mayor. But I also think it's important to remember that if we only were a high context society, we would take nature as uh, an aspect of all of our decision making. So I just made up a definition of backwards. Um, and I think that people who know me, I have two friends here who I've known since kindergarten and grade eight, Peter and, and Guy, they would probably agree that I, I do do things that are opposite to normal use. Um, and one of the best examples of that is getting involved in, the Eagle, in a, a campaign to preserve Eagle Ridge Bluffs in West Van as the Sea to Sky Highway was being built. We weren't really opposed to the highway, but we were opposed to the destruction of an ecosystem. I was elected to council, and a friend was going to do a nude calendar to protest the bluffs, and she said, you know, would you do it? And I wasn't sure as an elected, you know, person. Um, and then a friend said, well, I'll make a documentary about this, and we will get big coverage if Pam does it. And I thought, well, you know, this is the world we live in. Uh, you'll, you'll pay attention to that and not the fact that this, um, these bluffs are being destroyed. So we did the calendar. Um, uh, this is the producer of the film called Naked. It ran across, it was on CBC. My mom would get phone calls from people in Toronto saying, is that Pam on the television with no clothes on? Um, I didn't know at the time that I would be running for mayor. And so, it, you know, <laughs> as a testament to backwards, this would not be how you would launch your campaign. I mean, my campaign manager criticized me for wearing jeans when I was running. I can't imagine him saying, I know what we'll do. You'll take your clothes off, and then we'll tell West Vancouver that you are the best candidate, uh, you know, to represent them. What I learned from this, though, was... First of all, you can take risks and you never have to prove, again, if you go this far, that you mean it about protecting the environment. Um, and uh, so I, I chose to run for mayor. And I chose to run on a kind of a campaign of curiosity. I didn't really have a platform. I had four main questions. I wanted to do a much better job of preserving the mountains behind West Van, changing the pattern of development up there. Which, is working, which means working with the Guinness family, which is among the most traditional and conservative property developers in the world. Um, I wanted to develop a better relationship with the Squamish Nation people, um, pretty much invisible to one another as neighbors, and I didn't think that that was good enough. I wanted to engage the community in a, in a better way, and I wanted to uh, get in the game with the Olympics and have it be what would suit our community. And I said, those are my ideas. I'm not sure how we're going to do them. I, I, I really was not sure. And I thought by running on a kind of an open-ended question, but having narrowed it down a little bit, um, that would be engagement. That would be a way to demonstrate we need everyone. This is, we started then with, you know, creating a strategic plan. Uh, and I love this picture because if you didn't know who's who, and I told you, one of these people is the mayor, one of these people is the director of sustainability, and one of these people is a citizen, an engaged citizen. I don't think you could, I, I, I guarantee you most people would vote for either one of the men as mayor. And I get to that later, that's extra fun. But <laughs> I, I took the approach that we are all in this together, that the, the, any one of you could be elected tomorrow, and you were you today, and when you become a politician, something happens in people's minds, and they look at you a little differently. So I tried to, I tried to blend in, and you'll see a lot of the pictures. Um, I felt that that was a way of leading from behind, of demonstrating complete faith, complete faith in the, the community to work it out. Um, and one of the first things we came up with was, well, step back a bit we got rid of our advisory committees. And that was a real challenge uh, because you're going into the heart of the traditional way things have been. But I thought, let's replace them with working groups. The working groups have a budget, 
a dedicated staff person, a terms of reference, and they report directly to council, and we stay right out of it. They had a deadline, too. And in all 14 cases while I was there, we 100% accepted their recommendations. This is the one on housing. And why I love this picture is because the two gentlemen in the foreground, one is the president of British Pacific Properties, and one was the former director of planning. So these two have been responsible for the previous 30 years of development in West Van and made it you know, a highly desirable community. And there they are, along with everybody else, talking about We've got to legalize secondary suites. We've got to look at coach houses. We've got to shift from single family homes across the mountain to more dense and kinds of places people want to live. We also were building our award winning community center at the time, but before we had even started, I said, let's have a working group on governance. Let's ask the community how they would run this and take responsibility for this incredible, incredible community center. You probably heard Daryl Condon, he's the architect. I think he spoke here earlier. Um, and let it go. So we basically hived off our flagship space together with a governance um, model that was recommended by the community. And I put this here on purpose as well to show how it reflects that. In that our design thinking around what brings out the best in people has got to... It just has to do with being open and with allowing people to see what's happening and trusting that that's where we are our best selves. I know for sure in politics we're not our best selves behind closed doors. I could do a big talk on that, but I don't want to be too political. Um, here I am with my friend Paul Acton. He's a, a Squamish Nation artist. Um, I, of course, I set out to, to improve our relationship in, um, in the community with the Squamish Nation, but this is funny because this is during the Olympics, and he was carving um, uh, you know, in this beautiful space downtown, and I was just walking by. And I love this picture because it's not formal. Nothing official is happening. It's just the feeling of being friends with somebody. Or maybe, hopefully, you will all leave today and make it um, a, a project for yourself. If you aren't already good friends with somebody who's First Nations, or two or four or a dozen or more, then get going, because we have to know one another, and we have to have our two worlds collaborate around the things where it makes sense to, and there's ways in which we never will, because we're very different. But Colacton's uh, son is, is at Emily Carr with my daughter, and they're graduating tomorrow at the chance from Emily Carr. And I just think it's, it's wonderful that um, that's the next generation. I also met his mother last week at a Reconciliation Canada event for a couple of days, and um, her name is Gwen, and I said, oh my gosh, it's, it's such an honor to meet you. You're Quilacton's mother, and she goes, I named him Rick. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, she told us her story of being in a residential school in Seashells, and that's the purpose of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, and also of uh, this other um, uh, Reconciliation Canada, which is where we're just like together like this, and people like us get to hear the stories of what uh, took place. And as we were leaving after two days, very emotional two days, I said to her, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's extraordinary and that can't, it's never, it can't have been easy. And she said, you know, it's just a story and we can tell a story now, the story that we want to tell. Talk about backwards. We set out when we had the Olympics to partner with the North because they were sort of a little bit second string and West Van was a, host, a venue city, not a host city. And we had so much mining interests, junior um, mining companies that are, the principals are in West Van. And so I was really lucky they flew me, they meaning the town, not, not uh, Van Ock or anything like that, uh, up to um, Iqaluit. And I met the mayor of Iqaluit, Elisipi Shitiapik and Eva Ariak, the premier. And did you know, up there, their legislature sits in a circle? Very cool. And all the people who are elected, whoever you are, choose their premier. Wouldn't that be neat? You, you just get such, I think you get such interesting voting behavior if you knew that that's what happens when you go there and that you trust that of those people, 
they will pick the best one to, to, to lead. Anyway, do you remember the beginning of the Olympics? It was boiling hot. And so we've got, you know, all, all this great stuff happening at the community center for free for everybody. Um, and you can ask me about that later, how we pulled that off. Um, and people in these, in these clothes intended for negative 40. Um, Alyssa P. stayed with me for eight days. Uh, I was pretty busy flat, working flat out, but of course I had her stay with us because she said she had enough, they gave her enough money to fly here, and then that was it. And um, she, she had all these like, um, heat, like a heat rash all the time in our house, and she said, I'm really sorry, but you're going to have to turn the thermos down to 50. <laughs> because it's just way too hot here. <laughs> so we were in coats in our house, and she was going, I'm so hot. <laughs> anyway, um, that was an extraordinary experience to, to live with her. And we would catch the bus downtown every day, and she was always headed for uh, Northern House. And I would introduce her all the way down the big line. Do you want to meet the mayor of uh, Calumet? And people would be like, no way, this isn't the mayor. And she said, I would never have done that if you hadn't you know, made me. But of course, everybody, everybody wanted her, their picture with her. Um, why do we feel like we don't want to connect when it's our, you know, every impulse? We also designed a working group around climate change, and this is what it looks like. West Vancouver has been seeing, we've all been seeing more extreme storms, uh, but this was destroying the seawall, destroying public, public assets, uh, sewage lift stations that are also along the waterfront, and private assets, people's, people's places. So we, a group came together to talk, and I, I'm not going to go into it, but Anyway, to talk about work that needs to happen in the intertidal zone or even farther out in order to break these waves, in order to protect the asset that this is. Um, and really, that's the asset. And it's like the old growth forest. I mean, you know, we can talk about metrics all we like. This is the metric. If we aren't ensuring that the creeks, the, 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 uh, you know, the foreshore, the wetlands, the trees on the mountain retaining the water, the growth around the rivers, these salmon who we know are strong and who we know know where they're going. No matter how far away they go, they always come back home. Um, to me, this is what it's all, it's all about. And we won an award. We won a, a UN Global Green Cities Award for some of the stuff we were doing very quietly. We, you know, it's West Van. We don't really like to take ads out or tell people stuff. We, we just kind of quietly do it. Um, I showed this picture at the United Nations, thinking it's the obvious picture to show, and people were just blown away that this would be what we are ultimately motivated by. So we went to the UN, and uh, I took the citizen leader around our climate change strategy, um, a uh, member of council who worked har much harder on it than I did, and a staff person. And so here we are getting the award, and the reason I'm showing it is because, once again, if you had to guess who's the mayor and who's the staff and who are the citizen leaders, you couldn't, except that I still think you'd pick Steve, and he's a great guy. Um, the UN said we've never had somebody come with the community. And I said, well, that's not very UN-ish of you. Um, <laughs> but it's true. It is a super elite organization, and you know, I, I hope I'm not offending anybody, and, but because I think it's beliefs we share, and it does a ton of good work. But when you go there, you're really struck by how traditional it is. Um, even for lunch, I had a VIP go to the ambassador's dining room, and these three people who did all the work, paid their own way to come, had to go up to the canteen on the 15th floor. Um, and I said, well, I'll come with you. And at the UN, you can't really do that. You, you, your, your job here is to be the ambassador and, and play your role. But that was a very proud moment. This is another picture, of course. We had a big, big challenge on childcare. I love this because it reminds everybody that no one's listening to the mayor. That, <laughs> and the reason we're doing this is, is obviously for the children and our, our future. Um, but the school board closed down a daycare. And just think, you can think of so many examples where this happened. So of course the parents come and scream and yell at the council. We didn't close down the child care. It wasn't ours. It was in a school and they needed that space. But instead of me saying, it's not me, and it really threw them off because they're screaming at me in the microphone. I said, you know, you're so right. And 
what bigger job do we have than to figure this one out? I don't know what we're going to do. And you, Joanne, she's a wonderful person. She was so mad at me. But I said, you can chair the working group. She works at Hydro. <laughs> you can chair the working group, and you can tell us what to do. And within a couple of years, we built two new daycare centers. The province um, uses us as the standard. Um, and it was all done by the citizens. And it was all done because we said, we will give you the resources to figure it out. We have no preconceived notions. And when they said, we want that municipal building and that municipal building, we said, sure, if we can go get the funding from the province. And you can't say no to this. The province didn't have much of a choice. Um, so that might be one of the things I'm most proud of, is just that, that little kids are running around on the beach in a public building that um, isn't, isn't used for anything other than their welfare. I almost lost the second election over field hockey. I didn't see that coming. I thought most people would agree with it. Um, as Stephanie made me put this picture in here. It doesn't, it's, you know, because she says, look, you're always over there, you know, smiling and laughing and letting the life of the community come forward. Um, and so this, this is a project we worked on for 10 years. And the best thing about this is when Harper announced his um, infrastructure funds to stimulate the economy, municipalities everywhere were li long lists of things that they wanted money for. And our senior staff said, well, water and sewer, and, and here's the projects. And I said, you know, that field hockey field needs money. And if we can get money from the feds, we can raise another two. We can raise two million if they'll give us two million. And a uh, huge fight in my office with the staff because they said, that's silly. We don't need it. And I'm sick and tired of being told that as a girl who grew up and played sports. It, it, you know, there's all it, it, the sports that are dominated by women are, have been like 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 soccer has expanded. But the ones that are really most of the girls don't get the key facilities. Uh, you know, we we went and complained to the principal at Pauline Johnson, where I went to school, that the boys had the courts for just road hockey at lunch, and we never could get one. And uh, the principal said, "Well, you know what you could do? You could bring your nets down and your sticks and your tennis balls on Saturday." And we said. That's a great idea, and we did it. So all these years later, I was fighting for field hockey. We put the three bids in. We put field hockey first, and then water, and then sewer, and we got all three. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I knew the feds wouldn't turn down water and sewer. So um, and, and anyway, uh, here we are, you know, just this picture. I often would not want to be in the picture. I, I, can't, I don't think I add necessarily much. But what's really heartening is that the community wants, they do want you there when you've worked together on something. And it, it gives them a certain kind of a stature. Um, and so, of course, there we are. This is another picture, another favorite picture. Oh, we, we, cut, my, we cut me right out of the picture. Uh, <laughs> because that's, that's the vice chair of TransLink that's like cut off. Um, this was the big battle to get the two cents per liter gas tax. Uh, in order to fund the Evergreen Line. And I was the vice chair of the mayor's council at the time. But let's be honest, Gregor and Diane are the key players. They're, they're influential people. It matters what they say. They get attention when they, have, when they have something to say. Richard Stewart on this end is the mayor of the community that's going to benefit the most by the Evergreen Line. And Peter is there because he was so good at managing... Um, Peter Fassbender is looking down, managing uh, relations with the province. But the reason I put this in here is because, I don't know if you guys have read the book Quiet. It's really good about the power of introversion and how introverts observe and are so good at, at, so good at knowing what's really going on. And as a leader, I really try to pull myself back to understand what's really going on. And even though I was kind of like more involved daily on this issue, um, to, to demonstrate that these guys get the attention and I am there and I will do the running around and then it gave me a tremendous amount of freedom because the media weren't on me and that meant I had a little bit of room to, uh, to move. I was also vice chair of the Waste uh, Committee 
and we had to we had to do a major uh, public, re I guess, effort to reduce our waste. We got to figure out the, the, the we're running out of room at Ashcroft in the in the landfill out there. We probably need another incinerator, but that's dependent on how much can we reduce our waste. And so I'm talking about this at a Metro Vancouver dialogue, and a guy stands up and he goes, "Right, um, I'm listening to the mayor of West Vancouver." a community known for its conspicuous consumption, about how we're going to reduce waste. And he actually says to me, how much did you pay for that dress? <laughs> now this is the good part. I happened to be wearing a dress that I had got for $19 at the consignment store. I mean, I'm not making that up. And, and so um, I have to put in my favorite consignment store, which is... <laughs> Which is in West Van. And, I mean, they're great consignment stores everywhere. I, I love them. I think they're so much fun because you can walk in and afford just about anything. It's kind of like playing dress-ups because if it doesn't work out, that's also okay. Uh, Jane, who runs this in West Van, I go in and she goes, Now, you know, I won't tell anybody that you shop here. And I said, you know, look, it's somebody's clothes who lives in the community. I'm walking down the street. Women must be going. I think she's wearing my old dress. <laughs> Anyways, um, Vancouver Magazine did a, a you know a little sp a nice article. Adele Weider is a fantastic writer and a fantastic commitment to heritage um, it, and West Coast modern issues in the country. Anyway, she did an article on me, and after three interviews, all it was was about clothes and image and clothes and image, and I was getting so tired of it because I had some important things to say. I phoned up the editor of Vancouver Magazine and said, I think we should go for lunch because I'm worried about where this is going. And um, he sat me down and he goes, face it, anybody in public life is going to have to deal with the fact that people care about your image. Um, one thing, and I said, well, could you, could you say that at least most of my clothes come from, you know, a second-hand store? And uh, he said, uh, uh, no. <laughs> and that wasn't in the article. And I said, and, uh, and so I put, this is my, this was the picture that was in the art, article, and I want you to notice the shoes I'm wearing, because Adele said to me, it must be nice to be able to afford such expensive shoes. And I said, you know, I thought $40 was kind of a lot at, at, when I was at the second-hand store. Uh, and I still have them on today. Um, this is just going to kind of be fun wrapping up what it's like to, to be um, a little maybe different than what people's mindset of a mayor is. Uh, we uh, went to Victoria to meet with the Sierra Club because we have so many great environmental groups in West Van and they wanted to tap into our fu the fundraising ability of the community. George Heyman actually was the um, executive director at the time. And we said, sure. So we went over and we had a meeting and a fellow was there from Australia who, was gonna, who did a, I can't remember the name of a film, but a film we were going to show. And um, after an hour of talking, he looks right at me the Australian scientist, guru, climate change person, and he says, right at me, he says, you know what would be really good? Do you think you could go back to West Van and see if we could get the mayor to come? <laughs> and Steve, the sustainability director, picked up my purse and he goes, can't you tell she's the mayor? He goes, have you seen her briefcase? I mean, there's the evidence that you're talking to the mayor. Um, I have been called the mayor's wife. I've been called the mayor's assistant, and because I would go out, you know, and, and when I, the guy that said to me, um, I'm here to see Mayor Goldsmith Jones, and I said, hi, uh, he said, oh, so you must be the, the assistant taking me to meet the mayor, and I said, no, I am the mayor, and he said, we'll take it as a compliment, because everyone knows the assistant is way hotter than the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, at, a, at a police uh, honors ball, giving um, an award of uh, honor, uh, bravery to one of our police officers. Very formal. You're, the lieutenant governor's there, and the solicitor general's there. And the, I was a board chair of the police department. Um, we were told to go to a certain room for the protocol about how you do this. And when I got there, the person on the door said, Oh, I'm sorry, um, this is for board chairs and police chiefs, not wives. This is like three years ago. I told that story at a Legion Robbie Burns dinner in West Van, and some old boy said to me, I think you've single-handedly revolutionized the feminist movement among women over 80 in West Van. <laughs> so I guess the message is to not be afraid of these things. Um, and obviously, everybody hears it all the time. 
about being yourself, but there really is only there really is only one way to be, I think, in order to be successful. Um, I bring my books because they make me feel not nervous, um, but I read a ton, and I try to relate that to what I'm actually doing. And the only other challenge is, Mark, I'll just leave this up here. I'm not going to say anything. You come on up. Come on up. We'll leave that for later. <laughs> I guess that's it. Um, okay. I usually kick off the Q&A uh, with a question. And one of the things that I remember hearing when, when uh, after her third term, Pam announced she would just not run again. And she was very popular, and I think that probably the community had just expected, and that's what happens, right? You're like, why wouldn't she run again? So you chose not to. You actually chose to go back to school to do an MBA in Aboriginal leadership, mm-hmm. which, is ama- which is totally effing backwards. Like, that's just... <laughs> So, uh, what's that like? How did that happen? And what's life after politics like for you? Uh, uh, well, thanks, Mark. Um, I, first of all, I believe in, in sort of self-imposed limits. Um, and I, I really, truly felt that two terms was the best uh, I could give. And that the public deserves that. And uh, also, the only thing you really need to know about politics is it ends badly. If you hang around long enough, it, you land on a kind of a down. So, um, you know, I felt it's not just me and, and things that I'm interested in, but in, in preserving the public trust and the, and the social capital that we created and that, that sense of it being so good was on my shoulders. And I didn't want it to be about me. And, you know, a true test of leadership is what continues well after you're gone and what doesn't. I just was at Art Phillips' memorial service, and he was an early mentor for me way back in grad school 30 years ago. And we are still living some of the things he, he envisioned. Um, anyways, I also wanted a bit of a business background because another thing they like to say to you if you're a politician is that you don't know anything about business. I had been in business. I had sold computers. I'd supported me and my husband in, in school uh, based on doing well in sales, which was also handy in politics, that skill. Um, but I wanted to go back to business school. And so looking around at all the different ways you can do that nowadays, which is fantastic, SFU started the first of its kind in North America, MBA in Aboriginal Business and Leadership. Well, I, I, you know, to me, that's my social science piece on top of business in SFU so cool, what's happening downtown so cool. And so I said, could I apply? I didn't know, is it for Aboriginal people? Or No, we want it to be you know, two worlds, we want you to we learn from one another, but it's intended to recruit top Aboriginal uh, business people, and it has. In fact, my friend Cal is here, he's staying with us. Um, if he's, where are you, Cal? Oh, there he is, yeah. Um, uh, and I got there and, and realized I was the, well, we had one other woman who was from India, so that's kind of Indian. Um, <laughs> but she, I know. In fact, she said that. You were named after me by mistake. Um, anyway, uh, she, she's no longer in the program, so I'm the only non-Aboriginal person in the program. And it's a tremendous privilege, tremendous reorienting what I say, how I say it. it, it you know, I, I was sort of mildly complaining one day, um, and I said, you know, sometimes it's very difficult being, in, well, for one, a minority. What a great experience to be in a minority culture in my case, in this class. And I was saying, sometimes it's hard though, I'm not in the club and I don't know the, you know. And a friend says to me, you think that's hard? He's Cree. Try being Cree working for the Nishka. That's really hard. (laughs) (laughs) So the class has taught me the things we can and should laugh about and the way in which we can come together. So I'm doing that. I'm also a consultant working in in bringing business and government together. By not fighting, I don't believe in lobbying. I believe in understanding one another's strategic goals and working on it together. Um, and um, this is probably the first public opportunity, really, in a year and a half. So it feels really great. Thank you, Mark. Well, welcome back to public life. <laughs> okay. The next question we're going to attempt. There is no. He disappeared. Move to your right, Jonathan. 
Move to your right. Jonathan, move over. There. <laughs> that fellow, who's my counterpart over there at Hootsuite, <laughs> is uh, wearing his uh, uh, Creative Mornings t-shirt. That is the president of um, the GDC in British Columbia and our host over there. So, Jonathan, do you have a question for us? Oh. Morning person, watch out. Sure do, Mark. Uh, <laughs> very, very proud to be representing Hootsuite here with three phenomenal questions. If we have time, I'd like to ask them all. But the main question we're looking at is, how does Pamela balance such a high level of both life and work with homeschooling kids, running the city of West Vancouver, being such a wonderful host to the, 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 uh, the community that she lives in, as well as embracing all other communities in the Lower Mainland. How does she balance life and work at such a high level? Well, um, you, you could ask my husband, you know, <laughs> if I am. Um, I don't see, you know, w one of the really interesting things about how we've progressed is um, there used to be a real distinction between, oh, so I'm sorry. There used to be a real distinction between public and private. Um, and I think for sure technology has blurred all of that, democratization has blurred all of that, and that's all really great. I just decided that this is my, this is my life. There's no inconsistency between me here, me as mayor, me homeschooling the kids. Um, in fact, the reason we homeschooled wasn't really so much a statement ag against school per se, it just seemed like such a waste of time. There's so much more you could do. Uh, and so that actually was less of a balancing act by taking them out because it takes, it's a fact, it takes 45 minutes a day to learn to write a really good paragraph and, and add and get and start in grade eight. In fact, our youngest daughter was the valedictorian at Rockridge like four years ago when she graduated from high school and didn't go to school till grade eight. And she started her valedictorian speech by going, I forgot to go to elementary school. Uh, <laughs> So I found homeschooling way easier. It could be just so natural and we could just decide to get in the car and drive, a, drive to California for a week or just read all day long or whatever. Um, I think being yourself is balance. Well, you mentioned earlier that um, the power of, of quiet and introversion in leadership. And of course, I'm often told that's why I'm such a great leader. <laughs> <clears throat> Does anybody have a uh, thank you? <laughs> Same thing? Oh, Hillary. Hi, thanks so Hi. much for uh, speaking and sharing about your process. I was really struck um, by your role as a convener and think um, as somebody who is attempting to sort of like do that kind of work um, in a creative way, I am constantly sort of overwhelmed by just how it's a lot of work to work with people, and especially mm -hmm. with a lot of different types of people, and trying to bring them together, to put them on, bring them on the same page, it's both really rewarding, as well as really taxing. And I was just hoping you could give some tips for how to help empower people to take on, you know, take on that role themselves, and also to sort of like, really run with what it is that you're kind of convening them around. Right. Um, well, for one thing, it's not a fair fight if you happen to be the mayor. You, you know, you have authority, and so when you give it away, which I tried to do as much as I could, people, they really feel like, wow, I'm, I'm getting something. And so I think um, that's, I, I often look at the problems that political leaders get into, and I say to myself, why don't you share your authority? If you think it's all for you, you're, you're destined to fail. Um, I really believe in understanding the different styles, and, um, you know, I will dominate, if, I, if things aren't clicking, I, you sometimes just have to kind of do that. But if you understand who's a supporter and who really gets turned on by supporting and allow them to do that and don't ask them to chair the meeting, um, if, you, if you allow somebody, you know, there's this, there's this sort of bias towards everybody participate and everybody speak. Some people, that's anathema. But if you ask them after what they thought, they'll tell you. So, you know, I think that's what community means. Behaving that way. One more from here. Thank, uh, also, thank you for, for speaking. Uh, I was actually, it's too bad you were leaving public life. I was just talking to my sister who was visiting from Toronto and we were thinking it would be really great if you moved to Toronto to upset Rob Ford. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Would it be that hard? I mean, anybody could do that. <laughs> um, I was wondering, actually, if you could speak a little bit to uh, maybe the mechanics of undoing the advisory board in favor of uh, the new governance model, and maybe I imagine there were some barriers that you had to had to break through, and what those were specifically. Yeah. Um, I knew what I would replace advisory boards with. Uh, Sam Sullivan tried that in Vancouver and reversed his decision within a couple of months because he didn't have a plan. So I had a, a vision and I worked with our municipal lawyers actually to write a, uh, the way we had to consult with Victoria because when citizens meet who are appointed by council, all sorts of rules come in. The worst rule that comes in is the agenda and the minutes and the da 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 da, da and the set time and the, nobody works that way anymore. So we made these appointments not appointments by the council. We said to three councillors, you run it. Three councillors isn't a quorum. You pick the people, you sign off on the terms of reference, it's all over there. And that way, citizens are free to meet in the coffee shop and work on it. They can do whatever they want. So we loosened it up. Uh, when it came down to deciding the vote to replace the advisory committees with working groups, um, and uh, it was 4-3, so it was really close, and I had to just build that confidence, I think. And one of my leadership attributes is, and I, <laughs> I will take it, and I would say to my, and that's an that's a important point, I would say to the members of council, whatever hits we're going to get, give them to me. I will never sell you out. I don't even care if you're trying to sell me out. I'm not going to do that. And that created their, uh, you know, some political will. Um, one member of council said to me, you've gone completely around the curvature of the earth and we can't see you anymore. So, you know, it's nice that you're leading, but <laughs> you can't get out too, too far in front. And then we had success. And once we had one or two, um, then, you know, I, I, people see that that's such a viable way. The advisory committees were sort of like spies in a way. They, they were always judging council. The community didn't know who they were. There was a sort of a superiority there. Uh, we know better than elected officials and uh, that was gone too. So it just felt like the windows and doors, were, Gandhi says, you know, never be afraid to open the doors and windows and let the fresh air blow through as long as you're on strong foundations. Jonathan, do you got something from Hootsuite? Jonathan Strabley. We've got a bit of a two-parter here. So what we're going to be looking at is the uh, a one-word answer after, or to, to direct the answer towards life after office. After being mayor of West Vancouver, is there a feeling of optimism or pessimism? And with that thought, how do we increase female representation in politics in Canada today? Optimism. Um, my bias around uh, what keeps women out is that, you know, women actually don't mess around. Like, are we going to get this done? Are we going to work together or not? Men hang in there. They, they like, you know, a little bit more of, in my experience, and that's not fair to say about men in general, but in politics, the adversarial nature of it is, I, I, I know this sounds sexist, but it's better suited um, and, and so I think you bring the best out in everybody when you have a little bit of both. I think that parties um, get in the way a, a lot. I, I, don't think our, I think our legislature could work much better if it wasn't always this is your team and you may not ever break rank. The most interesting things happen when people break rank. You have to be able to. It's not the end of the world, it's the beginning of the world. So I, um, it's, it, it makes me, myself, holds me back from getting more involved at senior levels. But um, I think that there's also lots that could be done to, to improve that. Um, as for women, you know, uh, there's more and more and more opportunities for women for sure. I think it's like 60% of st student bodies now in universities are women, which is, which is great and, and not great in some ways. Um, so I think that's a very tough question and I, I tend not to want to get into gender politics that much. Um, I believe that the system conditions people and everyone in that system should be highly aware of that and working towards saying, 
you know, when you go to Ottawa, you can't sit like this, liberals, conservatives, greens, NDP. You go in your special rooms for your special separate meetings. I mean, where is this going to go? The first time I met Jim Sinclair, the head of the BC, uh, what's the, the BC Fed? Uh, we'd been invited by Tamara Vrooman at Van City to this really great retreat in um, Italy. She wanted to bring left, right, not for profit. I was the only politician and we had to pay our own way and stuff like that, but they organized it. And he met, on the first night, we're sitting, 15 of us, around a dining room table, and he says to me, why the hell would I want to go anywhere with the mayor of West Van? This is, this is the opening. And uh, I said to him, well, let me, let me tell you what my dad said to me. He said, you know, Pam, your mother and I didn't raise you to go to Italy with the NDP. And, <laughs> and Jim is hilarious. Jim said, I want to meet, I want to meet your dad. Since then, we've become good friends, and we've stra I would go to him as mayor of West Van to help me with strategy. Not necessarily to do with anything that he's particularly involved in, but he's got such a bright mind. What would, and then all of a sudden, this provincial election now, we're going to have to pick between parties that ha we have friends in both who are stepping up to serve. We have friends on both teams who are knocking themselves out. And um, this environment goes away. So that's, that's very challenging for me. Yeah, I don't know who to vote for. Um, okay, we <laughs> have, um, we're a little behind the schedule. So I knew, I'm gonna have to ask for one really good question. Who feels really confident they've got a, a real doozy that they can ask? <laughs> no pressure. Angela Hot, you know, is it a doozy? Shauna, is it a doozy? No, a lot. We should do a, we should wrestle. <laughs> Whoever wins to the death. What do you want? Who wants it? I see Eric in the corner. You want the question? You did have your hand up first. Yeah. All right. um, so we were talking in our group that we're really interested in the way that you were leading in terms of giving it back to the people and opening things up and actually not having all the answers. But I wonder if you could speak to if and when that ever backfired or if you gave it to people and disastrous. Well, there's nervousness yeah. in giving people power, especially yeah. groups um, of people. I, well, uh, and also, will you run for a national party? That's just a sidebar. Yeah, yeah, I'm ta working on that slowly. That's partly what I'm doing after politics, thinking. Um, it backfires when you're in highly structured environments. So it was very, very challenging West Vancouver's role during the Olympics because we were very committed to a community you know, party, and, um, and we, we were subject to so many rules, so many rules, um, one of which was, you know, that we, did, we flatly refused to put taxpayers' money, property taxes, into the Olympics, but we went and raised money. I just basically pulled together the team that had worked in my campaign and was good at fundraising. They raised two and a half million dollars, uh, uh, just given money, um, and so we set up a whole structure that they would run it, that they would get the, the rights, that they would give, give tickets to whoever it was that you know raised the money. I didn't want anything to do with it. I wanted it to be about the whole community and the whole world coming to West Vancouver and enjoy. We had Julie Payette from the space station. We had a whole bunch of stuff going on. That was not, that didn't go over very well with Vanock or the IOC. Um, and uh, you know, I had to be in both worlds at once. We gave it to this community. We gave the authority to the community. They did it. Um, everybody participated. Nobody was, every school in the Lower Mainland practically came through the Canada Space Station display at that community center. But um, I was criticized by all sides because it could not be as transparent as it should. I would have liked it, but I respect Vanock and the IOC rules. Policing is a whole nother story. I went through an awful lot and again, wishing to connect, wishing to empower the police board, wishing that citizen oversight be the measure of our policing system. I mean, that's why the RCMP has the, 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 the real issues it has, is lack of civilian oversight, and running right up in, against a highly structured, highly closed environment. So the times when it didn't work were the times that were too structured. Thank you very much. Well